West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Tomorrow, of course, marks the first primetime hearing from the Bipartisan Committee investigating January 6th. And over the past 11 months, Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney of Wyoming, the vice chair of the committee, has emerged as the public face of the investigation. If those responsible are not held accountable, and if Congress does not act responsibly, this will remain a cancer on our constitutional republic undermining the peaceful transfer of power at the heart of our democratic system. We will face the threat of more violence in the months to come and another January 6th every four years. Cheney is a very odd figurehead for the movement to prosecute the ex-president's attempted coup in the court of public opinion. She provides an interesting case study for the question, what does a politician do when they want to be part of a political party that doesn't want them? I've covered Cheney's political career for almost a decade now. To be honest, spent much of it viewing her as a kind of an object of scorn. I mean, she is a hard right Republican and one of the most extreme foreign policy hawks in the party. Before entering politics, the first time she sort of came on my radar screen, she was probably best known for her policy group, Keep America Safe, which levied some pretty disgusting attacks against Obama-era Department of Justice officials who had, in private practice before they joined the government, defended Guantanamo Bay detainees. Cheney formally launched her political career in 2013 by trying to carpet bag a Wyoming Senate seat, despite being born in Wisconsin and spending much of her adult life in Virginia. In fact, as The Intercept reports, Cheney, quote, launched a campaign to represent Wyoming in Congress with a Facebook post geotagged McLean, Virginia, her real home. Cheney was challenging incumbent Wyoming Republican Senator Mike Enzi, a staunch conservative from the right. But she was never able to shake the carpetbagger label or provide a coherent reason for why she was a better choice than Enzi other than, I'm a Cheney and I want to be a senator. In fact, the most memorable moment of that race was Cheney throwing her own sister under the bus by coming out against marriage equality despite the fact her sister was in a same-sex marriage. Cheney ended up dropping out of that race before the primary. But two years later, in 2016, she ran for and won Wyoming's only house seat. That's the one her father, former Vice President Dick Cheney, held for a decade back in the 1980s. And she quickly rose in the party ranks, becoming the third ranking Republican in the House, a position also previously held by her father. And for the duration of the Trump administration, Cheney was a bog standard right wing Republican, if not more conservative than most of her peers. She would occasionally criticize Trump in public, but usually attacking his foreign policy again from the right. Cheney voted with Trump's agenda nearly 93% of the time. That's more than, for instance, Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky or staunch Trump ally Congressman Matt Gaetz of Florida. And then, well, and then January 6th happened. And Cheney, like most of her party and the country as a whole, was obviously sincerely and genuinely outraged. 
Now, at one level, she appears to clearly have made a political calculation that not only was Trump's conduct morally indefensible on substance, it was bad politics as well. You can see, hear her on a leaked phone call with House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy on January 10th asking if Trump will resign. And you asked, if, if, you know, what happens if it gets there after he's gone? Is, is there any chance, are you hearing that he might resign? Is there any reason to think that might happen? I've had a few discussions. My gut tells me no. Um, I'm seriously thanking to having that conversation with him tonight. I haven't talked to him in a couple days. You can hear in that conversation that, that, that Cheney and McCarthy are sort of on the same page, right? It didn't last, because at a certain point, other Republicans, McCarthy among them, who had some mix of the first-order abject horror at what had happened and the second-order political concerns, realized the way the politics were blowing and just retreated. They either shut up about the insurrection or, or in some cases, did a complete 180. Just three days after that phone call, 197 Republicans, including Leader Kevin McCarthy, who you just heard saying he considered telling Trump to resign, voted against impeachment. Cheney had the courage of her convictions, and she and nine other House Republicans voted yes. And that was the beginning of the end of her political career, at least in its previous form. A few weeks later, McCarthy flew down to Mar-a-Lago to kiss Trump's ring and pose for a picture. And the party was firmly back under the ex-president's control. Except Liz Cheney, the third most powerful person in the House Republican caucus, refused to go back to the way things were. She said, rightly, January 6th changed everything, correctly noting that Trump was a unique threat to our democracy. But for the time, she remained in House leadership, even though Kevin McCarthy tried to oust her. The first time in February of 2021, he used a secret ballot vote and the Republican conference overwhelmingly voted for her to stay, which led to some awkward moments like this one. Do you believe President Trump should be speaking, or former President Trump should be speaking at CPAC this weekend? Yes, he should. Congresswoman Cheney? Uh, that's up to CPAC. I've, I've been clear in my views about uh, President Trump and, and the extent to which following, the extent to which following January 6th, uh, I don't, I don't believe that he should be playing a role in the future of the party or the country. On that high note, thank you all very much. I, I find that clip fascinating because Cheney is trying to sort of walk the tightrope there. Like, she doesn't want to make a big deal out of this, but she's also going to say her piece. The obvious and evident truth. And over the coming months, the party began to sour on Cheney as Trump tightened his grip on the Republican conference. In May of 2021, they voted again to strip Cheney of her leadership role. This time, McCarthy did not use a secret ballot, which meant Trump could know who voted which way. And this time she lost. She was replaced by Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik of New York, who had a far less conservative voting record, but who was willing to be vocally supportive of Donald Trump and, more importantly, the big lie of a stolen election and a bunch of other far-right conspiracies. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi then appointed Cheney to the committee investigating the insurrection, where she was then elevated to vice chair, and that was the final straw for her fellow Republicans. Cheney was ousted from the Wyoming Republican Party, and along with Republican Adam Kinzinger of Illinois, the only other Republican who sits on the committee, she was formally censured by the RNC for, quote, participating in a Democrat-led persecution of ordinary citizens engaged in legitimate political discourse. I will refrain from playing the B-roll of what the legitimate B-roll uh, discourse looks like. Kinzinger announced he is not running for re-election. Now Cheney is facing a primary challenger who was endorsed by Donald Trump, who of course has a personal vendetta against every Republican who supported his impeachment. And in fact, predictably, Trump went down to Wyoming last month to campaign against Cheney. Liz Cheney hates the voters of the Republican Party, and she has for longer than you would know. Wyoming deserves a congresswoman who stands up for you and your values, not one who spends all of her time putting you down, going after your president in the most vicious way possible, and loving endless, nonsensical, bloody, horrible wars. Going after your president in the most vicious way possible. The nerve. Wyoming primary is not until August, but a recent poll has Cheney down 30 points with voters. And in a way, when Trump and McCarthy say, Cheney's not a real Republican, and the bipartisan committee isn't really bipartisan, they're right. 
because the Republican Party has determined that forthright support of American democracy against its enemies, foreign and domestic, is not allowed in its ranks. So Liz Cheney is hardly a liberal. She is a hardcore conservative with policy positions I find repugnant in some cases. But on this one defining issue of our age, the future and the enduring value of American democracy, Liz Cheney is on the right side of history. It is Thursday, the 9th of June of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is... Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Now, I know there's a lot of people who hate grits, but if I served it to you and called it, well, it's either a creamy or a coarse polenta, you would love it, and you know you would. As soon as you put creamy or coarse grits in there, people go, well, I never eat grits. Oh, yeah, really? I bet you eat polenta. All right. Is it all in a name? Well, maybe. Or it could be in the terroir. Could be. If you want to think dirty, uh, this early in the morning. Is it early in the morning where you are? It could be whenever you decide to meet the day. And as we're meeting the day here, during farmer's hours, by the way, that's what we've resorted to. We have gone back to the old habits of old. Were they habits? Maybe. I don't know about you, but I lived in a time where we had to go out and get the milk cows out there in the woods and bring them back. Why? Well, of course, because we had to milk them. And this was before we went to school. And before we went to school, there was still some homework to do. So we had to get rid of our chores so that we would do our homework because you could do it on the bus. But I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we we took buses from our rural farm area out there in um, the, the Willamette Valley of Oregon. And it's Oregon. All right. Not Oregon. Okay. How's your day going? We're going to have, uh, is it going to be bigger than Watergate? Let's hope. Or is it going to be memory hold like Iran Contra? I think it's going to be memory hold like Iran-Contra because wherever Bill Barr is, yeah. And Bill Barr was actually back in Watergate and think how much stuff has been memory hold from that. Yeah, I remember the first argument that came out was everybody does this. It's just that Nixon got caught. Oh, really? Okay, well, if you're going to be a criminal, sometimes you're going to get caught. Everybody's a criminal. I love the law and order argument, too, is that we can't have this law because people are just going to break the law. What? Come on. I thought you were a bunch of jarhead billy club pounding people. I didn't realize you were cowering cowards in a hallway. I don't know. Is that being unjust? Were they all cowering cowards in a hallway? Well, they were all in a hallway cowering. All right. Even when people like an adult teacher called for help. Well, we don't know what's really behind that other side of the wall. What if those kids hooked up and they're mad at us now? After all this treatment that we put their parents through after all these years. Yeah, I'm telling you, that power structure there is exactly like Ferguson. Scratch it and you're going to have a skib. They don't support themselves on wayward travelers going by getting a broken taillight ticket now, do they? No, I think they have a ready-made population to (laughs) get a few dollars from after they've worked in the fields all day. All right. So who's going to run into a hail of bullets to save those kids? The moms. That's who. <laughs> and they did. Okay. Um, Just don't call it critical race theory. Because it will be called that. 
you know it. And what's the other one? Social empathy learning. I is it is that empathy? I I, I don't know. I mean, they they make it sound like caring for another person is a bad thing. It it shows some kind of societal and moral weakness on a part of a person to not capitalize on every tragedy. And I love how they run, when I say they, the repugs, run to the microphones during these tragic events. And they are the first ones to start calling the Democrats. So they're trying to politicize us by trying to take away our guns. No, we're not. We're trying to say there's too many guns on the street. Can we at least lock them up in a safe every now and then? Oh, no, you're trying to take my guns. Why is it we're always trying to take your guns? Because you don't have an argument. And I actually believe that they are chaos agents. They want the chaos because it behooves them to have chaos. Because that's when the fascists and the Nazis always come in and say, we've got a better plan. And that better plan is listen to us or else. And we're supposed to be happy about that. They're all about free speech, but don't be a 73-year-old guy coming in with a K95 mask wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt at a maggot event. You'll have the actual Masters of Ceremony, the guy running for the U.S. Senate, which is supposed to be the civil body in our government. That guy came out and punched out a 73-year-old guy because he simply was wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. And that's verboten because it's free speech. And apparently free speech has consequences, and that's what we've been trying to tell them. You can't yell fire in a crowded Reichstag and not actually have one, so that's why they said it. Oh, we'll just set the fire then. It'll be fine. And I get to hear about from all of these maggots from Mastrioni all the way down to, I don't know, maggot dog catcher talking about how our cities were on fire. And yet, in most instances, the cities that they talked about being on fire, you know, like strip mall, uh, uh, auto shop, whatever, um, were set by... Uh, Cop affiliated bo boogaloo boys, and well, were they cop affiliated? No, they were trying to foment a race war, along with a few others. You know, agent provocateurs, freelance, even maybe we could say, maybe not so freelance. But there's already been court cases where you know, I think what was it a. Like an auto zone type auto parts dealership that got torched. Guy had an umbrella. Remember that? Turns out to be that guy was not a boogaloo boy. That was a guy that guy was an actual cop affiliated proud boy or oath keeper or one of those types. Three percenter maybe. Doing God's work. And what was that? Start a little Reichstag fire and hope that the uh, war actually begins now. Is this the time they're really going to get up and try to kill us in our sleep? We're going to be ready. Okay. I'm telling you, everywhere in America is going to be Fallujah. You don't want to be in an intersection with a bunch of people on all four sides and, I don't know, eight sides? All with high-powered, uh, high-capacity, rapid-fire rifles. Did you know that in Texas, the law that allows uh, a kid to have an AR-15 but not a handgun arises from a, I believe it was in the late 1800s or so, where Texas uh, ascribed the handgun to the the preferred tool of the criminal. Where, whereas the rifle was for hunting and, and, and whatnot like that, because, you know, you lived, you lived out on the bush if you happened to be Australian coming to Texas. So how is it 
that if the ascribed tool of the criminal is now the AR-15, that that's, see, it's a rifle. But it's actually the ascribed and preferred tool of the criminal to kill a bunch of little kids at a school. Kill a bunch of old people and an occasional 30-year-old walking by at a supermarket in Buffalo. Etc., etc., etc. So I think the onus in this argument isn't upon the actual name or whatever it is. Is it a rifle? No, it's the prescribed and uh, preferred tool of the criminal. Get it out of the hands of 18 year olds. I don't know. Should 25 year olds be, uh, maybe they should be 25. You know, there were actually some gun laws and some other types of uh, societal restraints that uh, that actually put 25 as the, the breaking point where you met your majority. Not 21, 25. Yeah. I don't know. And this is in the time when people like routinely died in their mid thirties because <laughs> environment. I have no idea. Why did they die so young? Actually, when you think about the numbers, those statistics, there was a lot of little kids dying too, because you know, infant mortality, I didn't have the best uh, hygiene. Okay. No, oh, we'll just wash the kid off with the horse slop out here in the gutter. Okay. That's good. Okay. You know, diphtheria rates dropped when the internal combustion engine came about because there was less horse shit out in the streets. Okay. So, I don't know. What's going to happen with the lithium batteries when they start leaking? Are we going to say, how could people be so stupid to give up the internal combustion engine? Look what this lithium battery pollution is doing to the world. Yeah, I know, but at least we had electricity. Okay, for every action, there's a reaction. I'm just warning you, okay? Well, all that aside, yes, we do have the committee hearings this evening, and I'm a little upset they're going to have it during my show. But at least on the opening, I can probably tell you that there's going to be, I don't know, some, I hope they're not long-winded speeches, please. But I think that maybe we can just go ahead and have the show during the long-winded speeches. Even if they're short-winded, that's going to feel long-winded. I know. I do it all the time. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll just go ahead and go with that. And you can always get this on podcast and listen at your own leisure as well. But we're going to do it in the time frame allotted because that's what we do. The show must go on. Speaking of which, uh, what do we have in store for you in what we call the curated part of the show rather than, I don't know, the tossing and turning that we do at the beginning? Mm -hmm. We're just emulsifying the salad dressing. Look at it that way, shaking it up. Well, starting off at the top, of course, we had a clip there that shows you how you can tell how partisan the January 6th committee is, by the way. Hardcore arch conservative Liz Cheney is a baby eating representative democracy commie. All along, who knew? Who knew she was a commie? Well, I don't know. If you look for accountability and actually live by the ideals of American representative democracy, you're a commie and a baby eater. And uh, I don't know. We have to have the Nazis take over, they're the only ones that can save us. On the rest of the menu, speaking of which, <laughs> the Oregon Supreme Court ruled that private companies in Oregon jails must abide by federal laws and serve inmates equally. Oh, those Nazi feds are going to make me try to treat everybody equally. No. Can you believe that? They're going to argue against, oh, we, we have a constitutional right to be discriminatory. I don't know. Maybe with the Supreme Court, they'll get away with it. Brittany Griner's case is tangled up with that of a lesser-known American also imprisoned in Russia by the name of Paul Whelan. And a rebel golf league, backed by the Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund, 
has made sports watching stooges out of Phil Mickelson, Dennis Johnson, and 46 other golfers turning a blind eye to the kingdom's notorious record on human rights. And they need to be ridiculed. They had to give up their PGA membership to do this because they're going where the money is. The blood money. Okay. Moving along. After the break, we then move to the chef's table where Angela Merkel said she will not apologize for her failed efforts in engaging Russia. And who should? And a Fiji court has finally ruled the U.S. can seize a Russian oligarch's $300 million super yacht. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. page at netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link and the chat room is monitored as you know and even if you don't it is monitored by kelly lincoln thank you kelly if you would look across the page from that chat room link near the bottom of our home page at netrootsradio.com there is the link to our patreon page as gunner the english Bulldog, our snoozing sous chef, is hard at work doing his job, snoozing, snoozing, snoozing away. So he's a really, he's a hard worker at it. So you'll have to excuse the noise in the background. Anyway, uh, the link to our Patreon page is there because, well, we need help paying our bills. And thank you to those of you who have helped us do so for the past 11 years. Okay. We do take this quite seriously, and we continue to take it quite seriously. If you could afford to send us uh, what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink and send those funds our way once a month, it would really help. So thank you for considering doing so. And thank you to those of you once again who have for the past 11 years. I just like saying that. Okay, 11 years, yeah. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. And follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's, and then that gets linked up on Twitter. So you can find the show notes and links where the real, real reportage is. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, wherever podcasts can be found. Deezer. We're even on Deezer. And, of course, we are also the uh, deep archive of the Netroots Radio <laughs> Library is at the Internet Archive at archive.org. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by staff at the Associated Press. The Oregon Supreme Court has ruled that private companies providing services to people in Oregon jail custody must abide by federal laws prohibiting discrimination in public accommodations. See, I always thought it was a private esteemed club to get into, you know, jail. You know, it's hard to get in. It's even harder to get out. The ruling last week came in a case involving a deaf man who filed a federal discrimination lawsuit. The Oregonian reported It notches a victory for civil rights advocates who argue that people with disabilities have borne an outsized burden in seeking medical care while incarcerated. The decision will save lives, said Emily Cooper, legal director for Disability Rights Oregon. State lawmakers in 2013 made correctional facilities exempt from laws requiring 
equal treatment in accommodation, citing as an example that jailers might need to segregate people for safety reasons. Oh, that's a bad thing. The ruling stems from a 2016 lawsuit filed by Andrew J. Abraham, who alleged Corazon Health, Inc. had violated the Americans with Disabilities Act by failing to treat him while he was held at Clackamas County Jail. Corazon, you know, that means heart, right? I like that. Stopped operating in Oregon in 2018, according to spokesperson Morgan Hook. The same year, a $10 million settlement was approved to the family of a woman who died after the company's employees failed to keep her hydrated while she detoxed in a Washington County jail. Not even a glass of water for you. Writing for the majority... Oregon Supreme Court Justice Martha Walters noted that while jails themselves are exempt from certain public accommodation laws, the for-profit companies operating behind bars must serve everyone equally. And that, folks, is the magic of the market. Tucker of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. Brittany Griner is easily the most prominent American locked up by a foreign country, but the WNBA star's case is tangled up with that of a lesser-known American also imprisoned in Russia. Paul Whelan has been held in Russia since his December 2018 arrest on espionage charges he and the U.S. government say are false. He was let, left out of a prisoner exchange in April that brought home yet another detainee, detainee Marine veteran Trevor Reed. That has escalated pressure on the Biden administration to avoid another one-for-one swap that does not include Whelan even as it presses for the release of Greiner, an Olympic gold medalist whose case has drawn global attention. For Greiner and Whelan, the other's case injects something of a wild card into their own, for better or worse. The U.S. government may not agree to a deal in which just one of them is released, potentially complicating negotiations. But Whelan could also benefit from the attention given to Greiner, which has cast a spotlight on his case. And though the U.S. may hesitate to give up a high-level Russian prisoner in exchange for Greiner, who is charged with a relatively minor drug offense, it's possible it would be more inclined to do so if both she and Whelan were part of any deal, and that would be a prisoner swap. A two-for-one. The potential interplay between the cases is not lost on the families and supporters of Whalen and Griner. It's still very raw, Whalen's sister, Elizabeth Whalen, said of her brother being excluded from the Reed deal, and to think we might have to go through that again if Brittany is brought home first is just terrible. But what's really bad about feeling that way, she hastened to add, is that she and her family absolutely want Griner released too. It's not like we don't want her home. We want everyone out of there, out of Russia, and away from that situation. U.S. officials have not said whether swaps are being discussed that could get Griner, Whalen, or both home, or whether they'd accept a deal that yields the release of one without the other. A spokesman for the State Department office that advocates for wrongfully detained Americans declined to say how the cases might affect each other, but said in a statement that the office remains committed to securing the release of both.
Harris of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Out of public view for months, Phil Mickelson returns to golf under severe scrutiny because of where he's playing and who is paying him. Mickelson, a six-time major champion, the most popular golfer this side of Tiger Woods, and now he is being referred to as a stooge by a human rights group for being among 48 players who have signed up for a rebel golf league backed by Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund. Mickelson, who last year made history as the oldest major champion in golf's 161-year history, and Dustin Johnson, are the leading faces of the LIV Golf Internet Invitational Series. Would that be the 54? Hmm, I don't know. Anyway, the greatest threat to the PGA Tour since it was formed in 1969. Along with disrupting the royal and ancient game, it has forced Mickelson and others to weigh the value of taking more money than they have earned in their careers against the kingdom's notorious record on human rights. The cash being offered by the Saudis is irresistible, especially for players like the 51-year-old Mickelson in the twilight of their careers. Signing bonuses have been reported as high as $150 million for Johnson, even higher for Mickelson. The Washington Post quoted Greg Norman, who oversees the circuit, as saying that Woods turned down an offer described as high nine digits. It just requires players to potentially jeopardize their future participation in majors like the Masters and in the Ryder Cup while overlooking the riches that flow from the public investment fund and facing a torrent of questions about accepting cash from Saudi Arabia, which has faced a global outcry over the 2018 killing of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi and other human rights violations. It was Mickelson who called the Saudis scary mother effers in comments reported in February, citing Khashoggi's murder in the kingdom's consulate in Istanbul. And then he later groveled in a statement by saying, I've made and said and done a lot of things that I regret, and I'm sorry for that and for the hurt that has caused a lot of people. I'm certainly aware of what has happened with Khashoggi, and I think it's terrible I've also seen the good that the game of golf has done throughout history, so can I have the money? All right. Let's get to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. Hedgehogs are a lot of things. They're small and spiky, covered in quills, and some people even say they're cute. Now, a new study says that they are also the origin of resistance to methicillin, an antibiotic derived from penicillin. That pointed observation appears in the journal Nature. Antibiotic resistance is a huge clinical problem, and methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus otherwise known as MRSA or MRSA, can be difficult to treat as many have developed resistance to a handful of our frontline therapeutics. Historically, it has been assumed that resistance in disease-causing bacteria, including Staphylococcus, is a modern phenomenon driven by clinical use of antibiotics. Jesper Larsen is a senior scientist at the Staten's Serum Institute in Copenhagen, which is the Danish equivalent of the CDC in the U.S., Methicillin resistance was thought to be tied to prescription, in part because methicillin-resistant bugs were first isolated from British hospitals just a year after the drug became available for clinical use. 
But a couple of years ago, we found out by chance that MIC-MISA is present in more than 60% of hedgehogs from Denmark and Sweden. Okay. What's MEXC-MRSA? Methicillin and penicillin belong to the so-called beta-lactam family of antibiotics. They kill bacteria by inhibiting enzymes the bugs use to build their protective cell walls. MEXC and a related gene MEC-A encode versions of the enzymes that the antibiotics don't latch onto as well. Staphylococcus bacteria carrying these genes are therefore resistant to most beta-lactam antibiotics. But where did these resistance genes come from? They've been spotted not only in folks with staph infections, but in livestock, like pigs and cattle, and in some wild animals. And in Sweden, Larsen found that MEXC is really common in hedgehogs. So the big question was, why hedgehogs carry so much MEXC MRC? To find out, Larsen went to the library. Where I came across an old study from the 1960s, which showed that a particular fungus in hedgehogs is able to produce a penicillin-like antibiotics that is very similar to meticillin. So hedgehogs with this particular skin fungus would naturally be exposed to penicillin. And that could have launched an evolutionary arms race that drove the hedgehog's resident bacteria to evolve resistance. This was a real eureka moment and led us to hypothesize that wild hedgehogs has been a natural reservoir of MEXC-MRSA long before penicillin and meticillin came on the market. To confirm this suspicion, Larson and his colleagues screened hedgehogs from Europe and New Zealand. They found that hedgehogs in Scandinavia and the UK harbor a heavy load of mexc MRSA. They also found that the fungus carried by those hedgehogs had all the genes they needed to produce penicillin. We then went on and sequenced and analyzed the genomes of around 1,000 mexc MISA isolates, which showed that they first appeared in hedgehogs in the early 1800s, long before we started to use antibiotics in human and veterinary medicine. Now, that doesn't mean that we should feel free to use antibiotics all over the place, because it's not our fault, it's the hedgehogs. Because if having antibiotics around encourages bacteria to evolve resistance, taking antibiotics away robs them of their superpower, and it leaves them a little bit weaker than their non-resistant kin. It is often very energy-consuming to produce the enzymes and inactivate the antibiotics. This means that resistant bacteria will often be outcompeted by susceptible bacteria in periods where they are not exposed to antibiotics. So, if we really want to show MRSA no mercy, we should keep the methicillin to a minimum, and maybe keep at least a quill's length away from Scandinavian hedgehogs. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. Don't you wish your life came with a warning app? Stop. That dog does not want to be petted. <laughs> a heads up before something bad happens. You should not send that text. Uh-oh. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome, but prediabetes does. With early diagnosis and a few healthy changes, you can reverse prediabetes and prevent or delay type 2 diabetes. To learn your risk, take the one-minute test today at doihadprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good eating habits developed in childhood can last a lifetime. But getting children to eat their fruits and vegetables is a common problem. Eating them adds important nutrients, helps control weight, and reduces the risks for many serious illnesses. Children in the U.S. are eating more fruit. However, 60% of children get fewer fruits than recommended, and 93% don't get enough vegetables. Child care schools and school districts can help change this by meeting or exceeding federal nutrition standards for meals and snacks, including fruits and vegetables wherever food is offered, and helping children learn about and taste fruits and vegetables. At home, parents can eat a variety of fruits and vegetables with their children and provide them as snacks, even if it takes many tries. Also, parents can include their children when shopping for, growing, and preparing fruits and vegetables. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? 
That's all we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Equal justice under law, that's the noble principle carved into the marble facade of the Supreme Court building. Today, though, six right-wing corporate-dominated activist judges control the present court, and they're implementing an elitist creed mocking that ideal. By putting the interests and power of the wealthy over the rest of us, they're turning justice into an anti-democratic concept of just us. In ruling after ruling, today's Supremes are political operatives taking power from the many to further empower and enrich the few. One huge change occurred in 2010 when the five Republican judges decreed that corporations be given a constitutional right to spend unlimited sums of their cash to dominate our elections and to pack our courts with judges who serve them. Sure enough, a majority of Supremes are now in harness to the corporate agenda. Consider their constant push to rig the rules against workers. While the federal judiciary has aided corporate bosses for decades by chipping away at hard-won legal protections for working families, the chisel has become a jackhammer in the last few years. The Supreme Court's Republican majority routinely pounds precedence, logic, truth, and the Constitution itself to demolish the structural pillars of labor rights and organizing. In a 2018 case, for example, the GOP judges undermined the funding of unions by arbitrarily striking down their process for collecting dues, a practice the court itself had authorized 41 years earlier. As Justice Elena Kagan bluntly put it, there was no reason for the court to barge into this matter of long-settled law except that the Republican majority simply didn't like the previous decision and overruled it, quote, because it wanted to. This is Jim Hightower saying, This is not justice, it's raw politics by black-robed partisans supplanting America's hallowed rule of law with their own anti-labor whim. Howdy-ho, folks. Thanks for tuning in and sharing my weekly commentaries. Also, please join me for a live web show I host every other Tuesday, the Hightower Lowdown Happy Hour at the Chat and Chew Cafe. You can join the action live online as I chat with grassroots leaders and progressive sparklies from around the country. Go to HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew to find out about upcoming guests and watch past episodes. That's HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew. Welcome to 60 Second Civics from the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. We're joined by a very special guest, Justice Paula Nakayama, an Associate Justice on the Hawaii Supreme Court. In recent months, we have seen a rise in violence against Asian Americans. What can Americans do to help stop this alarming trend? We must encourage everybody to learn, understand, and deeply appreciate and embrace the rule of law in our country and as a concept. The aim of our country has always pointed towards justice. I trust that the recent violence against Asian Americans is an anomaly and that Going into the future, our country's aim will remain true towards justice. Thank you so much for joining us today, Justice Nakayama. It was an honor to have you on the show. That's all for today's podcast. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1865. 
Labor leader Helen Murat was born to a wealthy Quaker family in Philadelphia. Helen grew up around the written word, as her father was a bookbinder and seller. In her youth, she attended library school. Using her writing skills, she spoke out for women and children in the workplace. In 1902, she joined Florence Kelly and Josephine Clara Goldmark in investigating child labor in New York City. Upon completion, they issued a report on their findings. The report was instrumental in the state legislature passing a compulsory education act the next year. Helen went on to join the Women's Trade Union League, serving as their executive secretary for New York for eight years. She founded the bookkeepers, stenographers, and accountants union. She helped to lead the shirtwaist strike in New York from 1909 to 1910. The next year, tragedy struck the industry when 146 women and young girls died in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Helen helped to investigate the causes of the fire, helping to uncover the negligence of the employers that led to the disaster. Helen's lifelong relationship to the written word helped her to become a prolific writer about unions and working people. In 19 in 1914, she published a comprehensive book, American Labor Unions. In the preface, she explained the purpose of the study, writing, Newspaper accounts, while stimulating public curiosity, do not give an idea of the movement as a whole. Her book, instead, undertakes to give the labor union's point of view. Helen Murat dedicated her life writing about and advocating for the workers' point of view. She was one of a generation of progressive women who made a lasting impact on the labor movement, child labor, and workplace safety. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 62 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of about 88 to 90. So we know what to do. Partly cloudy throughout the day with all lovely fluffy clouds pushed by winds out of the east-northeast at less than 5 miles per hour, then becoming westerly later and increasing to 10 to 15 miles per hour. Mostly cloudy skies overnight with lows in the low to mid 60s, winds out of the west southwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Then partly to mostly cloudy tomorrow with highs in the mid 80s, winds out of the west southwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon have been updated, and we now stand at 450,052 confirmed cases, with deceased increasing by two, standing now at 546. It's not over, folks, by any means. Grass pollen is rated very high right outside the window in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 32 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is very high at level 9, so do take care. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.02 inches, visibility is up to 10 miles, and relative humidity is at 81%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd. Crowdsources from around the world. London is 68 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 71 degrees and sunny. Rome is 68 and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 84 and partly cloudy. Kabul is 73 degrees and clear. 
Hong Kong is 82, and they have a rain shower with heavy winds. Tokyo is 66 and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 50 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 56 and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 80 degrees Fahrenheit and mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd. Crowdsources from around the world. The Washington Post brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Angela Merkel, who served 16 years as German Chancellor, said she will not apologize for her failed efforts to diplomatically resolve tensions between Russia and Ukraine in her first extensive interview since retiring from politics last year. Speaking during an onstage interview in Berlin, Merkel condemned Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine. She said nothing justifies the war, which flies in the face of human rights. But Merkel defended her decision in 2008 to oppose letting Ukraine and Georgia join NATO. She also said she did not regret brokering a 2015 peace deal between Moscow and Kiev, which failed to end a conflict that erupted in eastern Ukraine after Russian-backed separatists took up arms. I tried to work toward calamity being averted, and diplomacy was not wrong if it does not succeed, Merkel said, according to the Associated Press. It is a matter of great sorrow that it did not succeed, but I don't blame myself now for trying. The conservative leader's foreign policy, which controversially included deepening economic relations with Russia, has come under increased scrutiny since Putin started the war. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Leticia Beecham and Andrew Jiang of The Washington Post brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The U.S. secured a victory in its campaign to punish Russian billionaires for the war in Ukraine when Fiji's Supreme Court ruled, finally, that the $300 million yacht owned by a pro-Kremlin oligarch could be seized by American authorities. The ship, the Amadea, is headed to the United States, Justice Department spokesman Anthony Coley said in a tweet, posting photos of the ship leaving port in Fiji while flying the U.S. flag. The U.S. is deeply grateful to the Fijian police and prosecutors whose perseverance and dedication to the rule of law made this action possible. The court's ruling lifted a stay order that had blocked the United States from seizing the yacht. Amadea's owner is Russian billionaire Suleiman Karamov, U.S. officials say. The seizure comes about a month after Justice Department officials asked Fijian officials for permission to take the yacht after the U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control designated Karamov as part of a group of oligarchs who profited from the Russian government through corruption 
and suspect activity. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know, Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des tiers. Des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver